Hello everyone, today we continue with the second part of our video about the medieval central northern Italian warfare between the 11th and the 14th century. In the first part we gave a broad introduction about probably the theoretical part um, of uh, the Italian art of war during this period that we haven't finished yet. Uh, today we'll do it and and then we will pass to the archaeological and iconographical side of the story. The last point that we were making was, crucial enough, about the development of Italian infantry during this time. This was essentially the country with the strongest infantry recorded um, in the era, uh, both in terms of say, level of organization, uh, amount of troops uh, deployed, level of collective training, also actually the individual equipment, Italians actually had the best um, material, culture and technology, and definitely the most important one as a result, militarily speaking, the toughest infantry against uh, cavalry uh, in, in the period. Um, the, um, the, the story again of the lack of an early 14th century uh, Italian victory, of course, uh, has to do simply with the most obvious realization that there was no need, politically and socially in Italy, to fight with cavalry and uh, infantry disjuncted. So all the indicators that we have about the strength of infantry do not um, make us believe that actually the, the toughness of the same had decreased by that period in which um, other, uh, say, countries in the periphery of Europe were to be in the condition at least of fighting, which was definitely not a positive thing, civilizationally speaking, with, with uh, only infantry, uh, and uh, managing to beat cavalry in the process. We just don't have it for most Western Europe, which doesn't indicate per se that, say, those places, infantry were, were not good or were not as good as those ones. Um, this is a very underrated aspect, again, that comparative diachronic um, capacity of appreciating, in fact, the, the art of war for for this period and others are uh, stagnating, also historiographically. And uh, in general, uh, it's always a good uh, habit to assess, like, say, what were the, the most important things going on, um, militarily speaking, at least Europe-wide, then express some informed judgment, in fact, about the, the possible comparison. It's not an easy craft, because and not having had these specific, um, you know, encounters, you can't even properly say, well, we haven't tested them, right? But there are a couple of uh, incidents in which, actually, just after Courtrai, the French use Lombard and, and Tuscan infantrymen against the same uh, Flemish rebels, and it turns out that they performed, that they outperformed them actually, um, and uh, were quite impressive, even for the local uh, population that had apparently never seen the so-called Zalde, Zalde that were, you know, that probably the uh, Italian type of pike that is not really particularly, let's say, we, we don't know too much archaeologically about um, weapons at this level. At least we have a lot of iconography, but um, let's say still in this period medieval archaeology is sort of scattered uh, in the for, for even important uh, weapons and especially ones produced at this, this level. Um, in any case, uh, we will surely look at in other videos, in the later iconographic units we will be discussing part of the stuff, but I will have to make videos about the individual types of Italian soldiers during this um, era to just exemplify what, what we're saying, is just explaining a bit what we know, what we don't know about their equipment. I could actually make something like a focus, um, a special on this, uh, if you are if you're interested. Um, the re, uh, uh, last time we were criticizing as well uh, Nicole's insights on um, these general topics uh, because to make the long story short this also used to attribute um, uh, a lot right, of Western military development mostly from an Eastern influence perspective say, oh look, these things look similar across the Mediterranean, so there there must have been a, an influence that brought properly that weapon to be used in the first place. 
uh, I have a very different philosophy of uh, history of science, of history of technology. Um, and in the military field, the idea that is, especially at this point and in this context, of course, every country was essentially developing what they needed practically, and weapons, of course, were similar, but like armament was similar in general, technologies were shared, etc. But they, if they developed in, in a given place, I mean, we can document them substantially in their warfare, it's because it's, it's the local warfare that did it, right? So later we will talk a bit more about this, I think. There is not time today to cover properly the part in which we sort of observe this sort of, okay, look, the stuff looks uh, more like a, the, there's a style in this type of uh, sword that, you know, reminds us of some Byzantine or Islamic um, sources. Fine. Then uh, as the same Nicole, um, and I would say Italy is the best example of this because he had himself to recognize that given especially the very advanced level of um, Italian uh, arms and armor production, was actually the, the greatest in Europe and pretty much uh, in, in all the surrounding regions, um, there is just no way to... to yes, there, there is way to trace these um, similarities, but we don't understand, first of all, whether they're actual influences or it's just random, because there is not even too many ways you can make a, 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 medieval, mil, a medieval panoply in the first place, materially um and secondly like um what uh what of course existed also in terms of influences but also to which degree of difficulty we can sort of uh, elaborate on because this series about regional warfare is mostly dedicated on international influences um and in this case given also the fact that the italians were pretty much everywhere in the mediterranean with their trade um they um the the thing gets ever more um, ever more fascinating. Um, there is this, um, of course, due attention to Italian naval warfare that we uh, do not cover really for uh, original series. But uh, in the case of Italy, at least, we have, of course, um, marines that are just like, you know, ancient medieval times, actually beyond, they're just normal infantry, right? Normal say, in the sense that there is not, uh, like, if, if, when dismounted, they could perfectly serve in a, in a land army, and uh, having essentially the same uh, type of, of, of armament. And in the case of Italy, we talk about it because Italy was the only country that had virtually permanent naval forces, um, and that witnessed, this is at least what they say, like, that the greatest development in missile warfare, think about the Genoese crossbowmen, etc. Uh, at this, uh, in this time in history, um, because of the, the their naval superiority, essentially. And this is absolutely true. The Italians had, again, the best admirals, the best marines, the best ships that were used, as you know, by the major uh, Western monarchies um, for, for this reason uh, throughout uh, the entire period and beyond. Uh, however, I would note one thing, that is to say, the the story of, let's say, of the Genovese, uh, the Genovese crossbowmen, right, is uh, a bit, um, like, it's not that they weren't important, but they are sort of a bit too magnified as a sort of uh, exotic, almost war games unit, right, whereas... The, 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 we don't have any comparative data to actually claim that the Genoese had necessarily the best crossbowmen uh, in the first place. Um, it is surely possible that naval warfare helped uh, developing further missile technology because of the normally like long-range engagements that there were also a lot of, of course, boarding in that process. Um, took place on the, in galley warfare. I made a video about galley warfare as well, but also about this. Like there is no uh, satisfyingly convincing explanation of why, like it, it's naval warfare that would have been the, the pivotal element for the development of, uh, say, missile uh, fire. Um, it is true that actually the the Genoese have this more specifically selective. Um, essentially business-like, a bit like this Whistler, like controlled by the state, um, unit selling, 
right that is is certified you can't actually serve abroad um, it's always spelled what the republic uh, decides to, to use the strip fly this is in many ways true however for many communes it is uh, it is also true that we do find some of the best crossbowmen in correspondence to maritime republics but essentially this is true just for genoa and Pisa later on, and for the latter, actually, we know of uh, a military reform in the 80s of the 13th century carried out by um, a Montefeltro um, condottiere that was called to be the same captain of, of the city that, in fact, had nothing to do with uh, naval warfare. You know, it was from the Apenninic depths and not even from places where they had huge armies like instead the peasant one could be i discussed these things in the videos about genoa Pisa, etc i'm covering for the uh, medieval regional series all the italian communes that's quite a challenge but i'm quite proud of that uh, achievement because nobody really talks about individual histories of especially the continental communes it seems like the maritime republics are the only thing that happened uh, in italy during this period uh they're Actually, not even the the more the most important powers um, in some occasions, right? And in any case, the point I was making, in fact, is that um, when you evaluate the the strength of these um, this crossbowmen, um, there is a difference between, let's say, some uh, professional, semi-professional units that are objectively developed by the single communes and not just the maritime ones. Um, as uh, one of the few actually fully permanent, right, um, of the um, of the state, and the um, thousands and thousands of um, crossbowmen, uh, even in the tens of thousands, that were employed uh, in single uh, engagements uh, in the larger coalition um, hosts that were like especially by the, the mid 13th century to the 14th like normally in, like ranging 30,000 men and you have like in Italy at this point actually the greatest display of popular strength uh, that we're aware of in the period um, Europe wide um, because the art of war the, uh, develops essentially re revolving around the latter rather than the, the, the individual units that you can sort of connect to the, the single commune in, in that regard. That, that is definitely telling us something. But there are, for example, also the Tallien that are these uh, leagues, right, especially in Tuscany, that towards the latter period starts really expanding quite dramatically its, its um, military capacity, whereas, say, in Swabian times, uh, Lombard was just like the the single most um, say performing place or just where the, th the most important things uh, take place uh, actually there are interesting studies showing that um, f for a while at least it was believed that there was in fact this sort of more Lombard phase and then the Tuscan one towards the like as a watershed the mid 13th century let's say um, with an alleged decline um, especially of Lombardy in that sense and instead, it's been demonstrated that well until the mid-14th century, the crisis of the medieval civilization, the military standards had not just remained, had, had uh, increased uh, in uh, all across the, the two regions, but that actually uh, Lombardy, broadly meant, still maintained sort of the upper hand in terms of actual um, military quality. Um with perhaps the notable and the, the notable as aforementioned exception of Pisa that really in the first half of the fourteenth century has the single finest um armies and uh like greatest tactical achievements, greatest victories uh of the period. Right. So actually, even though it's interesting of course to study naval warfare as always, it was very secondary. Uh, like throughout all like pre industrial times to to warfare uh, in general, in spite of the shockingly traumatic resources that the Italians pour, did pour into it. But again, compared to the ones that they poured into land warfare, that is not equally celebrated in this sense. It's, it's that, like, those are, it's the latter that 
turn out to be utterly insane. Utterly insane. Um, now, um, during the 13th century and beyond, uh, cavalry uh, remained decisive in Italy. Uh, we said it before, there is never, in spite of Italian infantry development, um, a prevalence of foot right, in the entire landscape of, of Italian warfare. Right? Again, infantry is pretty tough, it puts up hell of resistance, it's, really, it's heavily drilled, and it has shocking uh, collective capacities, but it does not surpass cavalry. Right, Italy does not develop the, this, the arms um, develop in parallel, and especially uh, in the from from the mid 13th century onwards, they develop synergically on the battlefield. They operate um, perfectly aligned, perfectly um, in tandem, right, and they always cooperate. You never see them separate, and this is a, an indicator of very high military uh, quality, right. Um, so um, the the role of infantry in a strictly tactical sense, in this as we've seen, would remain, especially from the second half of the thirteenth century, um, it would become actually because before that we don't have the the actual evidence. We have the sort of infantry phalanx separated from the the cavalry one, and operating differently. Uh, and this is a bit true, like for. Like we see, we were saying last time, Western warfare. You see this by the eleventh, the, the, the twelfth centuries, like developments that tend to develop in, in width rather than in depth, um, because cavalry has not yet reached the full peak that requires this front, essentially frontal charge, and so a sort of different battle lines in depth more than else that sort of standardizes by the thirteenth century, and the Italian infantry is from there on used exclusively because we do not see it in any other way like at least uh, until the, the second half of the 14th century which is a completely different picture for all european warfare and so today i say 14th century in this original series but technically we if you notice we will always stop to the mid 14th century right um and at that point they are always and exclusively and in this sense incredibly homogeneously deployed all over italy in the same identical way on the wings. This is yet another incredibly important aspect of the Italian art of war that these city states fight all in the same identical way, which tells you how this idea of fragmentation actually does not correspond at all to the actual, um, eventually, like beyond, uh, say, politically nominal or formal territorial um, like uh, cohesion of, of these forces. Right, it, imagine again. So all fragmented, all did something different, presumably. Absolutely not. Right, this is true at large for other countries. Like Germany was even way more fragmented, but of course they also fought all practically in the same way. So uh, one has to understand medieval civilization. That's not much of an option. Like Westerners did fight, um, especially by this point, in a pretty much all in the same way. Right. Uh, and the, in fact, this uh, sort of, we don't see really reforms, right? This is very interesting in the way this hosts, um, because unfortunately these are some of the things you will never know about medieval uh, armies because simply they're not documented. Actually, in Italy we have the highest documentation, um, but still proving in the sense that uh, even in the exception, there is no way to say, for example, who decided how these armies were to be um, not a raid, because obviously that depended on the commander, but let's say this was already and obviously happening in a prearranged fashion of some sort, and so how, for example, this passage from the the separated battle lines to the sort of in-depth ones with the wings, um, infantry wings uh, on the sides of cavalry re really happened, right? Especially because, again, they are all different states. There are 30, um, and all doing the same in the same generation, um, and this was essentially dictated by some concrete know-how, right? Consider that Italy has the only exception in the entire medieval, um, uh, say, documentation landscape 
of uh, an, the actual list of of the components of an army, right? You think that more or less we know like how armies were composed. Yeah, we, we know that, but we know it from um, say chronicles that tell us, look, you know, there were these I don't know thirty thousand men and four thousand were crossbowmen, things like this, or we have the later condottas that tell us, look, normally, like at least in the smaller units, because they, they were, uh, especially at this point, uh, there were these, this, this certain amount of troops um, and, and then others. But this will never actually tell you how these, um, uh, well, say, reflect, how this was reflective of the actual organic of an army that we see also bearing much less, more or less, all these armies are the same, like the largest field ones, again, are essentially a few uh, thousands of men-at-arms on, on, on horseback, and then a few tens of thousands of, of infantrymen with a few or some thousand crossbowmen within them. Uh, and everything, if, like if you subdivide, again, all the, the battle lines were normally three, and there's there were always three at that size of uh, of of the host, and then there were even four at a point there were some um, uh, spearhead units uh, picked from the like probably the best, the very the finest of the of the actual cavalry before battle to try to break um, the or to at least wear out, soften up the the first line, and so adding to like almost to the exasperation of this. Um, sort of encounter these various uh, battle lines clashing against one another. But again, we're not told much better. Like, uh, there's not a register that tells us exactly how an army that took the field was composed by. The only exception, which is not even telling us like the fullest picture, but that there is the actual list of all the troops, how they were called, who they were, and so on, is the famous book of Montaperte. That's the, um, the, the, it was actually a, a type of source that was evenly produced. Like all medieval armies had these registers and essentially administrative bureaucratic sources that were brought uh, with uh, the camp, together with the camp exactly because there were these calls to avoid um, to pick deserters, to um, to uh, say uh, list, I don't know which horse, where horses were crippled. There was also a system of um, uh, refunding compensations, etc. There were lots of officials working as civilians in the army in this regard. And uh, the Battle of Montaperti, I'm actually preparing a bit exactly on that, uh, is. Uh, like witnesses the Siena is breaking the Florentine army and seizing the, 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 the Florentine camp. And they take this book to Siena. Again, there were, every army had this stuff, but let's say all these books were eventually lost, right? This being an exception that we owe to some humanists because back in the 15th century when Siena was taken over by Florence, essentially the, the Florentines find in the in the in the Siena's archives the source that was also a, kind of a prize of, uh, of war, um, and they bring it. This of course Florence was the the birthplace of humanism. They had the finest philologists, all this stuff. So they actually take take this back to Florence and they preserved it jealously. And uh, you know it, it it has survived uh, in this way. But it's, it, it's the only source in the entire medieval millennium to tell us how an army actually was composed. That was a pretty big um, army, we're talking 30,000 men. So also exemplifying the sizes that required also this level of of uh, bureaucracy, right, to to field in the first place. Just think about the cost, it's shocking, right? And we're talking Florence that is like essentially just a provincial reality at this point. And it could field 30,000. Of course, there were allies from other cities, but the bulk, right, of the Florentine force did count that much. And it was just like one of the many cities in Tuscany. And this tells you what, at what kind of level war was made in Italy at this point. Like, even just compared to other European countries, it's utterly insane. Like, this does give you really that dimension. Um, so... Uh, the um, as we were saying, the role of the infantry in this regard, um, the role of the infantry throughout medieval warfare had been substantially um, 
tactically passive, which means that even though infantry is, of course, had the collective training to uh, move out there in the open to march together with the uh, say the, the, the cavalry arrayed for battle etc they would stop to receive uh, cavalry charges this is essentially what the Italian infantry do uh, we we see as we were saying last time um, some uh, like first of all a great level of autonomy of the the infantry arm especially during the clash between the militas and the peditas politically in the count in city councils that however never bring as we were saying before to like an actual battle if not maybe within the city streets which is a different thing of course infantry there was very advantage but even in that case there is never such a thing like just the cavalry against the infantry and vice versa right uh we've seen it at the battle of carcano that uh, literally, the infantry stands out there alone and is engaged by imperial cavalry that crashes it, but uh, and passes on to the to the cavalry. But the infantry manages to reform and to plunder the uh, the the imperial camp, right? And then we don't know what happened to even to it. But this is mm, this tells you a bit like the mental attitude of these infantry. Like normally, infantry would have not gone that far alone in mean, any other place in Europe. These are the same years eventually. Of which again, um, infantry manages to resist uh, just enough uh, to enemy cavalry charges until um, their own cavalry manages to, to save it. Legnano is the, the greatest example. Then you have um, even more unprejudiced, um, this were Lombard infantry, uh, in, in uh, unprejudiced cases in um, the Battle of Fossalta, we are in uh, 1248 uh, in which the Bolognese infantry uh, from a defensive position behind the river literally crosses the latter to meet the entire army cavalry and infantry of the king of Sardinia Heinz the, the son of Frederick the second will be actually captured during the battle by the Bolognese uh, alone which uh, is like again we don't know the say better specifics but obviously there was this almost competition with the militas like saying you're the knights we are supposed to to be the best of them. we will show you how it's done here as peditas and they engage in battle and then the bolognese cavalry arrives and they win the battle but the um the, um, the sort of uh sort of uh mental uh aggressiveness of this infantry reaches the peak there, at least moving, say, in a, in a strategical sense, right? Um, the uh, sense is, of course, that the infantry can counterattack the same cavalry in certain circumstances. For example, when at Legnano the uh, Lombard cavalry attacks the Imperial one from the flanks, the infantry was hard pressed, uh, counterattacks cavalry, but also because, let's say, that's eventually what this formation can do, right? Then from the mid-13th century, we see this tactics we explain, which the infantry is located on the wings of cavalry, never leaves it. Um, cavalry fights in the in corridor in between. And when it's broken, like infantry uh, tends to resist, then it, uh, it breaks because it's going to be attacked by multiple arms, cavalry and infantry combined anyway. Remember, there is not just cavalry on the other side. They are not aligned. They are essentially an auxiliary subordinated uh, arm, per se. Uh, and so they, they they can resist for their lives, but they, they melt away. There's no uh, example of that uh, outrageous resistance. There are some... There's, there is a battle in 1340 with Pisan infantry resisting on uh, the top of a hill where the, the, their camp laid, and apparently, like it was still a combined arms defense uh, against the, the Florentine army gets destroyed. And we're we told that that in that case, like the, the Pisan infantry was so strong, especially across Bowman there, that they managed to keep at bay the Florentine horses that were also cut down. Uh, in that sense, but it's um, it's uh, one of the closest things to the otherwise unknown capacity of missile to just stop cavalry charges 
which, however, does tell us it was obviously a combined arm tactic. It wasn't just about missile. Um, but in this second uh, phase of the Italian communal art of war, late communal times, call it in this way, uh, infantry has the precipitous role of um, enveloping the enemy cavalry. The problem is that, as we've seen, um, these armies fight all in the same identical manner. So this means that infantry wings are going to confront each other frontally, right? And if one breaks the other, um, of course, they can outflank the enemy. Except we, um, so and that at that point, normally the, uh, I mean, always actually the, the cavalry in the center breaks because it's attacked from multiple directions, just can't hold. And there are tro there is atrocious resistance, but these um, uh, Italian infantry is is really they're really equipped with very heavy stuff like uh, bills, uh, the same crossbows at short range against the, the flanks of the horses frontally and gale. It's it's really uh, cutting people to pieces. But the actual uh, finesse that we see in Italian. Um, combined arms is the flank attack of the reserves that not only as we've seen like this tactic was probably employed all over Europe it's just that um, there aren't such enormously continu and continuously fought battles for us and, and so such high documentation like in Italy for fully see it um, surely in Italy this tactic reaches the pinnacle of it in the first place and so what's the idea? The idea is to soften up the um, the enemy infantry wings with crossbows right? and we'll explain now a couple of other notes to this and on top of that you have this uh, concealed reserves on the flank of the army that uh, sometimes even actually may, may be detachments from other units that have come back from the clashes of the various battle lines etc this is not too important but it's that massive and they will attack the infantry on the flank and so it's always combined armor tactics um, this is extremely important because normally you okay so to make the long story short and finishing how it happened of course like infantry collapses and uh so the other infantry can close, like the enemy infantry can close on the on the flanks of the cavalry that is fighting. Uh, and this is such a splendid tactic. This is best documented in the Battle of Monte Cathini in 1315, one of the greatest Ghibelline victories, um, in uh, the greatest Ghibelline victory ever, actually. Uh, that um, really tells you the entire thing, the entire package. It, technically, the Battle of Campaldino was fought in the same way, but people have misread the sources. The, 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 the historiography made the worst possible deal out of it. And actually, in that battle, the same thing happened too. Uh, and we have other battles, in which, of course, we have the proof of this. Um, in any case, um, so it was so homogeneous. Um, there are two considerations to make that, um, of course, there is a relative asymmetry here in the forces involved, because in, in, as we've seen, hosts uh, uh, like were pretty much specular information, but of course they could va vary, uh, say, in, in individual merits and qualities of the commanders of the terrain, whatever. So um, the sense is that, of course, in order, you see, all of these lines would have had, presumably, we don't know too much how the infantry wings were composed, like, right, we know the famous, um, the idea of the pikemen, the pavis, and the crossbowmen, and people think that they were essentially small units, like, interacting, forming the entire picture. This is incredibly unlikely, and there is no proof of it, of it whatsoever, right? The, the truth is that, of course, as always, in there was um, heavy infantry with pikemen in the, in the front, um, and then, probably behind the the heavy infantry, there were the crossbowmen that, however, being in open order, could simply jump back and forth the lines. They could do interesting things, uh, advancing more easily, coming in particular moments of the battle. Also, in these three battle lines in depth, uh, our raid hosts, uh, normally the second line was the, the bigger one. Uh, it was known as the Grossa in Italian for this reason. 
and the this say it's a bit um, complex here to explain the strategical principle behind this but essentially you have like a center of gravity in there and uh, so the, the first units are the ones that more or less address the battle can give you some advantage if they win the the engagements or not um, there are so many unexplained things in medieval warfare and uh, let's say for example when one you know, one battle line won right not not always we know uh, how was it further engaged later on like actually from these battles we the Italian warfare is actually the only one that allows you to see more or less what happened of course things were simpler than they seemed but um, essentially this big effort um, to, cry, to to combine arms and to again harass with crossbowmen concentrated crossbowmen so maybe taken from the entire area and concentrated at that point of the battle to target the wings of the, the 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 second line of the enemy and simultaneously attacking them from the flank um, was the the best like probably the, the top uh, tactic that really showed which was the best army. What is fascinating about this is that we do not see, you see, normally when there was a, uh, this is true in, in warfare in general, when you attack somebody from the flank, they break, right? Um, and so flank attacks are devastating in, in the first place. They are usually also carried out by very small units, like you don't need entire battle lines, etc. It's something very reduced. But in these cases, we see that, uh, aside from the fact that probably they were always used, which is, also a bit against the the Vulgata that um, these were hidden that people did not know like those things like forget, forget about um, uh, the, the the story of uh, for example the Battle of Italia Cult so that the Templar had come just now from from the, from the Holy Land because he had seen the Turks doing the, these tactics were all over like they had began at Murray, just to be fully documented in major engagements that made hell of massacres. They had been used, really, from a long time, but they, they existed also before, just they, they're they obviously just not documented. You see, never make the silly mistake of thinking that everything was copied by other people. Like, the, those people, where they, did they take it from? Like, what, what, what is so complicated about the concept of flank attack, right, that... Uh, the, the single most shockingly heavily drilled um, 13th century top elite feudal cavalry could not perform at, on a regular basis like, you know, uh, eating it for breakfast. Um, these are things that do not make any sense, of course. Um, but as I was saying before, and in the, actually at the Battle of Tagliacozzi, you have an entire battle line concealed. So that was especially a very feudal battle. There were the Tuscans uh, uh, there too, that they learned a lot uh, from from that experience as they were growing just right now in that uh, art um, uh, by themselves. Um, but normally, again, there is a flank attack, it's done. It's, a, it's like at the Battle of Markfeld, where there is a concealed um, small, like it were maybe 50, 60 horsemen, right? Even in open order, because order doesn't matter. It's the psychology of the flank attack that breaks the last... Uh, battle line of the king of Bohemia that gets killed also in the field after that. In Italy, we, however, do not have... Montaperti may be actually like a good example of this, but we know too few about the battle to, to know the details, so that, that's why I'm also making this that video for that matter. Uh, but we, you, you will see it. But in all the other battles, when we see this battle much, uh, this tactics much better enacted, we do not actually see a flank attack directed to the battle line. Why? Because the battle line, that is cavalry, is um, uh, really flanked by these massive pike squares, right? Uh, they weren't okay. They weren't all pikemen, but they reached like one third per pikemen. It wasn't just like a. Um, improvised a material thing like the the, the troops here revel, reach also a level of professionalism that is uh, unmatched by numerical degree uh, in, in Europe as far as we, we know and um, and therefore the actual attack of the reserve comes to hit the wings first 
the infantry first. And on top of this, we're never told that this thing, this, this attack succeeded unless there had been a preemptive softening up of these infantry uh, blocks with crossbows. Um, and we, we see, of course, like when, when you look at the, like, of course, crossbows were always there from both sides, but in most occasions in which we see these infantry lines collapsing and opening, like with, uh, also with flank attacks, you have actually a crossbowman concentration that uh, tends to, by professional troops that were chosen oppositely for this, and we're talking about, by the way, a massive amount of, um, of fire, right? With uh, continuous shooting line by line, it is uh, uh, properly a, a line fire that would have reversed tens of thousands of quarrels in an hour on the enemy. It was something utterly insane, even in, in this dimension, right? You would think, uh, like again, when, when you look at even at the armies like the Mamluk or the Mongol ones, you look at the rate of fire, you're impressed. Yes, but these were crossbows, right, of the heaviest types, and they used them with these cannons, and we can make the maths for how, like, heavy this was. It, it, it's something to be, uh, it's something really unheard of. Not even the, the longbowmen of the of the Hundred Years' War were normally less in smaller armies. Which means, by the way, that this infantry to break was so tough, right, that does not, I don't know any other context here in, in Europe that, right, brings this enormous need of previous softening up to break only, by the way, uh, what was an auxiliary arm in theory, right? When, when you look at the Hundred Years' War, you're looking at essentially the, the longbowmen on the wings, there's also some infantry there actually, uh, the, the men at arms, the center, the, the equivalent, the dismounted, this would have actually fought them on, on horseback, right? But just it's at least in the major battles of the Hundred Years' War, what the English do, because there were certain American inferior that preferred to play on the defensive in specific terrain, etc. But essentially, uh, yes, there are clashes between the crowd, the, for example, the same general East crossbow. The, the interesting stuff, especially about Chrissy, is that for a long time people said oh, that battle is the, the one that shows how actually longbow is superior to crossbow. Is it? Because if you read the sources, if you just give them a look to the numbers, like the, the general East would have been, first of all, outnumbered and tough terrain, whatever, so it's not really... Um, like the normal situation which they would have been employed, plus they were employed in that anyway, and they would keep being employed. And so it makes you think because um, uh, that, uh, I'm a great fan of the English uh, tactics of the Hundred Years War, but I can't stand when they want to make it a matter of technology. Um, and so here, however, the point being that normally you, you don't see in, a, in an English or a French army to make just a brutal example, like this courageous infantry on the wings that uh, resists no matter what. You'd say, well, the English at the center, well, yes, again, but those were the equivalent of the knights. Here we're not talking about knights, we're talking about uh, just like the same ones the Italians had in the center of, of the formation. We're talking about in commoners' wings, right? So it's a very different thing. And, and the reason why we don't see this is because, again, in Europe, in spite of the fact that quite likely, but uh, you would be surprised really even just by stereographically how few studies or if any there is on this, like we do not see this, right? We see it, again, I personally think like everything, uh, it's a matter of guts sometimes, you have to accept that um, medieval warfare as any warfare actually gets um, down to that in many ways. Uh, they were deployed like that, but in fact, we don't see any, any major, major battle in which the sources feel the need to tell us about this great accomplishment of breaking the infantry. Uh, and actually, they don't even phrase it like that, because the Italians simply tell you how the battle went. Like, there's this pre-humanistic, actually, 
now proto-humanistic way of analyzing things that provides us, especially from the Florentine chroniclers, essentially with the best details on medieval combat, because people still, I mean, the altars were magistrates, uh, citizens that participated to those very battles. In the Renaissance, you do not find battles explained so well. Not even in Italy, because after the crisis, um, just the elite had taken over, the rest of the people were sort of kept away from uh, arms. And and so unfortunately, that's, that's uh, what levels a bit our understanding of so many things uh, a bit everywhere. But this is just saying how relevant this really was. And telling you the truth, when you look at the 20s, the 30s of the 14th century, now it, I should digress on, this was really the peak of Italian, actually from the 10s to the 20s, this is the peak of Italian warfare, possible medieval warfare in, in absolute terms. There are 20 years of conti literally continuous warfare since the expedition of Henry VII to the clashes that occur because of also the mercenaries that were left in the peninsula after that. And at this point, there are so many victories against especially the largest armies that were produced by the Welfs that were a bit more like the popular Republican regimes that uh, were, if you want, a bit more conservative regarding this idea of sending citizens to the army, etc. And uh, except these ones were getting exhausted and the great lords, especially Ghibelline lords of northern Italy, some also of Tuscany, um, uh, uh, De La Fagiola for Pisa and the Antelminelli, that is Castruccio, for Lucca, that carry out this magnificent combined armed tactics, mastering from the top of their military experience and their aptness. If you want the fact that the community had delegated them right, to be that more aggressive using mercenaries as opposed to citizens, for example, which would give an edge in terms of their overall quality, so not those monstrously large uh, hosts anymore, but something more contained, it's the prelude to the signories, to the lordships, and to that very different type of warfare that would have developed later. Because essentially of the refeudalization of great part of Europe right after the crisis. Um, of course, in Italy, it's always the patriciate that rules uh, from the city, so it's it's a different at least social extraction. But these these are the equivalent of the of the nobility uh, in other countries. Also, they will end up as elites marrying up much more internationally with one another after the crisis. We talk all this stuff in the, you know, other scattered lessons, but they they elude now the strictly uh, military side of the story. But it's just for saying how relevant the history of Italian infantry really is, but in the right key, like not because they actually dominated the battlefield, um, not because in fact. Like, even in the other countries, we can't imagine, actually, this infantry is underrated. Also, when, in fact, does not manage to break cavalry. This one is pretty impressive, isn't it? But, you know, how often have you ever actually heard of this in the later times? That I, I think this, this late communal warfare is much more interesting than the one, of the times of the, of, of the Lombard League. Uh, actually, technically, the Lombard League still existed... Uh, this is also underrated this time. It's basically, uh, it's, it's, it's the Milanese army, right? <laughs> As the Visconti take over pretty much the entire Lombardy. But um, in terms of art of war, right, this is actually much more impressive than the first part. Then instead is the more, ah, oh, yeah, you know, Italy, Legnano, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, right, but then in perspective, in... Uh, this, uh, unfortunately, is a problem of pop culture. There is only too much you can do. I mean, my videos are the pretty uh, meager attempt to, to change things, but it's not done just through that, of course. And I have also work outside of here, by the way. Of course, um, 
that's what I do because I, I, I don't talk too much about what I specialize in but when it comes to these topics that are closer uh, everything changes like in the strictly tactical sense like how do you know this well you must study the sources right you th these things are not known even by scholarship and I'm not kidding just check that out um, if you don't reconstruct battle by battle you cannot know that and you most scholars haven't actually done this right even when you look at figures like De Vries for example like I absolutely abhor his method <laughs> I, I think he made a very interesting job in his what was his PhD thesis that he eventually published in this comparison but it's just as if he told the stories of the battle not making an analysis of the battle even when he compares them it's an incredibly flat and superficial way of doing it the guy is just like a celebrity in the field and people who say gravitate around him think that they are the, the great experts of medieval warfare they don't even know this basic stuff like and it's it's sort of embarrassing at a level um, in any case uh, what else can we say for the introduction all here mm. um, the urban environment is quite interesting to normally we don't talk about this because major battles do not take place within the city gates Italy since it has the largest cities and the sort of the sense of the greater sense of political uh, belonging and like this enormous power that is wielded from them of course has a lot of very interesting um, battles to resolve the question of the militias of the use of artillery within the city streets which as you understand is you know pretty pretty bloodily effective there is a race for the commune as a public authority to monopolize control over such weapons if you are actually interested in infantry victories these popular victories within the city gates um, there is a lot especially against the German mercenaries who were often used by the lords and other often rulers that were foreign from city to city in this sense because they they called foreigner so the same Italians but from other cities right so there are these very interesting uh, tactical demonstrations of the fact that, of course even though cavalry was the size of in open field like within the city gates it was a very different story um, as we've seen um, generally Italian tactics were sophisticated for European standards um, and so was equipment really for all types of soldiers this is also very important aspects of uh, Italian culture in general the development of arms and armor that in the country especially in Lombardy reaches the highest level of essentially proto-industrialization in medieval Europe and makes really the uh, the finest um, equipment available this will be better seen now with the uh, in the iconography in the archaeology but it's not to be underestimated because certain levels of uh, fencing like for example the Italian hook as we were saying had uh, very high multifunctionality uh, you see it was just the same it was, it was here it's not a matter of particularly high you know material qualities about how the, the context in which it was developed right but for example the level of armament and protection for the same peasant levies was actually impressive all right the cost we were told that again I don't know a commune like the one of the land there is a very interesting document literally says and it's not like this was a, an exceptional thing and we find it just on passant in the documentation but there would have been plenty of this at some point in the beginning of the 14th century says we need 10,000 men used, armed with uh, you know body body armor um, this battle axes and um, and I don't remember if, if, if bikes or something I mean, it, an impressive 
level equipment and we are plenty of the actual dispositive um, provisions for the armament of the militias it's it's really a lot of stuff like a very heavy very heavily armored context right reflecting definitely the wealth of these communities reflecting of course the wealth of such uh, communities and the way they decided to uh, to go at war with and or just provide with well, a range of military service that was not necessarily sort of the most dramatic but could be uh, before I think I didn't finish it but say there are a lot many smaller engagements that are really the norm but mm, some of them are talking still in the thousands and the this is just the average going on then that's it's absolute, absolutely easy like every year uh, by the the beginning of the 14th century you have uh, say armies of tens of thousands here and there um, not every year there is the climatic 30,000 so versus 20,000 battle but it's uh, all, almost going towards that direction right many battles like some armies are of course summoned etc but there is no necessarily not necessarily like the big climatic battle on the horizon uh, every single time right surely there is a lot of warfare and so these citizenry and the peasantry too must be adequately equipped and also f quick fast again we do not know exactly how the entire system worked how much for example was properly provided by the state because largely we see as soon as the Italian city-states become city-states, which is around the mid-13th century, of course, like a level of um, dependency of the same uh, forces, especially the the infantry, that was sort of the more uh, on their own, right, type of troop, on, of course, what was provided by the higher authority, right, the other forces sometimes also probably the war bands the same infantrymen of the great uh, communal clans where right, rural families etc were uh, taking care of the matter themselves this is how the system had uh, evolved from also in a startled direction from these private means of course because everything was of course by modern standards very privatized anyway right it must always be taken into consideration. Um, we see, uh, of course, as we were saying, an important development of the crossbow in Italy compared to other European regions. It would be more interesting to study, in fact, how much in demand Italian soldiers were abroad, because aside from the Genoese and a few contractors in certain moments of crisis, especially the connections with France, there is not too much employ of um, let's say an average Italian soldier out there, right? We've seen them fighting, for example, in the Crusades. I made a video about the seizure baker that actually, um, like, uh, shows how the this Italian militiamen from central Italy in the Apennines they weren't even um, that these were volunteers, right? They were among the last to leave the actually the very last to leave, I don't remember which tower, which section of the line, the Templars, everybody recognizing this had withstood more than the same knights even. So actually, you know, we, we talked this thing about Italian military history and prejudices and effectiveness, but the more you dig um, into uh, Italian warfare, the more you realize how um, large amounts of quality, bravery, effectiveness you can appreciate throughout all these times in history which you uh, in which like I think the, the popular imagery left us mostly with the idea of again the militiamen as just okay it's not much in the first place. We've seen Italian marines this were um, especially the deal like Ross Bowman we've seen it in the video about the causes of the Mongol victories that 
basically get hired by uh, the Mongols as far as Persia, right, to fight piracy in the, in the Indian Ocean, in the Persian Gulf. And um, this is really fascinating because it shows how, mm, say, peoples like the Mongols that had a hell of a military tradition and were especially famed for missile warfare would come to hire um, not just specifically Western crossbowmen, that, that is, there are recorded, there are other Frankish mercenaries, but specifically Italian crossbowmen for their armies, right? In part, this was also because they were sailors, etc. But um, we have explained in that same video how, after all, compared to Western warfare in general, like the Mongol one, also suffers, for example, this is yet another prejudice, it's, it's, it's so overrated, in my opinion. Right. It's not to say that the Mongols weren't one of the greatest military machines in history, their rival with the Romans in a sense, etc. But they're incredibly different contexts and it's not much about what they did, but what they were that you have to be real about. Right. And in that video we were observing, among the other things, that again, like the Westerners were not that scared um, quite soon by the Mongols anymore and also because of their actual uh, military capacities so we find in Italian warfare mounted crossbowmen that's a thing they're really common to all Western Europe uh, also in this case we have from some communal registers some good documentation of how these units were uh, cared for how they were highly paid, but you see, we're contained in number. This is what um, really can be interesting to observe. Also, when you think about and the role of these specialized units, are a bit sort of the more iconic, the Genoese crossbow, etc. That when when you look at how much the the commune paid for this, they were relatively secondary units, but they they still cared for. Uh, probably because they realized that, that say, they required very specific training or uh, expertise and technical skills that needed to be cultivated more. That there is also the, all the problem of professionalism versus, again, am amateurism of warfare because of the, the soldier, the militiaman. Uh, that's something that gets blurred, uh, especially in the Italian armies, because you realize that to the... Um, of course, when we talk about the militias, these were virtually all-round professionals uh, on a regular basis. But when we talk about the infantry, it's a bit more complicated because they're a bit less documented, and the best documented are these probably like semi-professional, if not professional troops, like the specialized bike men, pavis men, are the story of the pavis men. I have to talk about this too, and uh, the crossbowmen. And then you have something all in between, uh, down to the to the peasant. You don't know, right? How like how much in between really really exists. You can imagine it, but there is no way to quantify it for sure. So the story of the Pavese is because people tend to make things bigger than they are. Um, there is this um, sense uh, in later medieval warfare that the Pavese shield develops. Uh, out of, and this is true, out of the Italian pavis that, uh, because the only other country was actually developing it uh, in, at least in that specific form, and here we should make an enormous digression regarding the documentation, because as that you can't he hear any different from a historian, of course, is um, Lithuania, and for reasons that are different but similar, like the context of warfare is, is different, but the idea is that the Pavis is developed usually in places that have a lot of missile warfare going on. Like in the 13th century, the Lithuanians are coping with the literal Mongols uh, in the East. And uh, However, their armies are mostly uh, cavalry, so they develop this sort of uh, this cavalry Pavis that is smaller. Um, the point is, in the Italians are actually the the first mention of the Lithuanian pavis predates the Italian one, but of course this has absolutely nothing to do with 
oh my god, so they were the first who discovered and that is spread the rest of you. No, right? You know, the reasons why these things happen. How many ways do you know how to build a shield, first of all? Right? Do you think that somebody invented a type of shield in the in the early 13th century for the first time and it didn't exist before and our documentation should be the proof of, of you know how it was established officially at the time? Um, that's kind of with this guy. Um, and um, the um, and, and Italians developed it shortly afterwards. Um, we know of Seth Schilden for, for example, like Frederick the Second instructs his German subjects to cope with the, the Mongol invasion, for example. So there is this idea also in the Slavic world in the Balkans that because of the steppes peoples there, that there are types of shields that are better suited for. Uh, just pairing yourself better from this hail of arrows that especially the nomads like to throw at one another. Now, as we've seen, Italy has a lot of crossbow warfare. And as such, likely they develop this type of shield themselves uh, because of um, such needs. Now, what most people really believe is that the, sh the, the pavis is this big shield. The pavise is, is something like the big shield that you can either fix on the ground or like a camping table um, or that you can tie to your back in, in the later medieval sense. In the for the 13th century actually, this is the single most important thing, we haven't the palest idea of what the heck the pavise actually is. Right? This is, nobody knows. It's not like there is a person who understands this better and can say it. Nobody universally it, all the people who study this thing know that nobody knows that, right? Because you cannot know that on the basis, on the actual evidence. And, um, of course, one could elaborate on, again, white developed layer in a particular way, etc. And uh, I actually have a video incoming uh, on this, like on uh, 15th century. Uh, rather than pavis, like just like this sort of sets shield, and that um, is particularly useful, of course, in siege context and so on. Now, so what is a pavis, right? Because um, then, what are we talking about? Why are these pavis many important, and why why do we talk them for Italy? So, the etymology has nothing to do with pavia. By the way, that's just an antiquarian, later modern Italian who came up with that, and he was Pavese himself. He was from Pavians, I said. You know, that he made the, the linguistic assonance. It has nothing to do with that. Pavese comes etymology, uh, etymologically from pavere uh, in Latin, which means um, the same etymology of, of pavement. All right. If the idea behind Pavese is, I studied this thing. By the way, um, some historians. Um, I mean, the etymology we, we reached it uh, is the same. Some historians you think of the concept of pavement most in the sense of extensional coverage, right? They say essentially the pavis uh, is called like this because it was either more enveloping or simply wider in some way. And so, and there are different reasons for saying this, also because we start having some iconographic evidence. I actually came up with another idea, that is to say, that is the closest to the actual Latin etymology of the term, which is pavement in, intended as something that you beat, like that you hammer on, in order to make thicker and stronger, right? So I actually don't know how this shield would have been built, but imagine through layers of wood that may have been deployed in such a way that made the shield especially what can you imagine thicker right if we're talking about increased missile warfare that i think uh, especially considering a place like italy with the degree of penetration of a of the kind of crossbows with the kind of 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 leverage that they had really like you wanted to be protected from penetration fundamentally Quite fortuitously, we also have a document deriving, oddly enough, from, like, you didn't think about this massive armies we described from the center and the north. Well, also the south actually had these, but there is less documentation. 
yes this comes exactly from there because there is um, like a purchase that the Neapolitan fleet makes for the Angevin like it, um, for and uh, the Angevin marines properly and uh, naval infantry and um, we get the not, not just the dimension the description of these pavises but the actual sizes and so we're a bit waited to think about the pavises, this really large thing that covered. It was actually a small shield. It was something like I don't know, like not too small. Like we think like sixty centimeters per forty, something like that. It's not that big. And we have other varieties, like the pavisotto, for example, that was used by horsemen as well. And so we gradually see that in this early period, actually, this pavise was not. Um, necessarily widespread um, uh, in absolutely in the stereotypical larger form we do see in the iconography actually pretty large um, shields that were not told by the iconography itself being pavises that look like the, the, the stereotypical pavise and they have also a very enveloping form which is very interesting because it shows actually in parallel with a very heavy equipment that there was some sort of assault infantry of some sort and I think it has some connections even with the use of the pavis but the problem lays in the term because in pre linean times the type of shields named of course would have corresponded to a non-categorical type of description Admittedly, yes, we know of targes, we know of uh, few, like, they're, they're in the, this in, 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 enormous uh, Italian vernacular production, um, and also the Latin one, of course. We don't see much dimension of shields, except for the pavises. Um, we see also that there are lots of pavismen in the tally of, of Tuscany, for example, in the thousands. And yet, in the battlefield, we don't see specialized units of pavismen that fight as such. Like we are told, for example, there's a very famous passage from the Battle of Campaldino that were some pav pavises, rather than pavismen, by the way. That's the, the, the distinction. Like were the pavismen organized into autonomous units? What did they do, right? Um, I have found this, that in the... Um, Infantry battles, like, excuse me, like pitch battles, we um, we don't hear, basically, of pavismen. Here, of course, of the knights, we hear of the, the pikemen a lot. Um, we hear of the crossbowmen equally. But we don't hear of the pavises. So this idea of the tripartition of these things stems mostly from... Uh, an account of Villani that talks about the Battle of Campaldino, how these weapons were used all by infantry without any greater specificities. People like to invent out of the, uh, these accounts things that the accounts do not say, and things regularly in military history are much simpler than the ones that um, and we think, normally we tend to think com by complicating what the account actually tells in very straightforward ways. And in the aforementioned Talia, so this money that was put in common by the this wealth alliance of, of the Tuscan cities, again, pikemen, pavismen in this case, even though we don't understand exactly what the role was in the battlefield, and crossbowmen. In fact, in the, the wide abundant description of pitch, massive pitch battles, we're never told what these pavismen actually do. We find the pavismen described only dispositively, so by sources that describe how things should be, not how they necessarily are, in combat especially. In the popular units, these were paramilitary, um, these were militias essentially that uh, operated in the city streets, right? Uh, there were warehouses in which they had depots in which they had these weapons. They had things like double-handed axes, um, pikes, um, you know, the, this the, and pavises, by the way. Um, and so, and 
these um, are similar in the various Italian city-states because of course as we explained more or less they all thought in the same way and the interesting fact here a bit like in the document of the Talia is that we, here we, we hear the mention of men that were to be equipped with pikes than other men that were to be using the say the double hand axes, the, the manaya as they were called and, and others had to, to use the pavis which is not an, offens an offensive weapon it's a shield and there is no doubt about this so the question is what the hell did this shield men do? now in the history of the art of war we the only time you can think properly of shield bearers are two contexts like one the feudal one which means like some boys, um, Serbs, that literally give actually all weapons to, including horse, spare horses, etc., to the knight. The other are things like, I don't know, the one in Assyrian art in which you see actual shield bearers that do not fight but just bear the shield for archers to take cover. I've never really been convinced that this is the case um, practically in, in real combat. Um, nor that um, this would stem from necessarily contexts that were not so, in fact, seniorial in nature. Uh, the shield bearers as an assistant is done for a man of some status, right? Uh, not for the average crossbowman. Um, especially in an Italian context where you have this very highly civical and republican sense of egalitarianism. Of course, the barons on horseback are, they have their attendants and they have this kind of men, but what about the crossbowmen? Those are not noblemen. Um, I noticed some, so actually, as much as that it, this is concerned, there is no explanation that tells you how it really was. But I noticed something, that while in pitched battles, you, you never hear the pavisman. In siege warfare and urban battles, you do hear in the accounts a lot about the pavisman. And you know what you don't hear of in the laughter? That instead you hear a lot of in pitch battles, pikemen. Right? This makes an awful lot of sense because especially the pikemen cannot really operate like we've seen this single wings of uh, infantrymen could be up to 5,000. We're talking about the size of Renaissance squares, right? It, it, it was insane. You can't have this in, in, a, in a narrow city streets that you can visit on vacation at places like Tuscany or Umbria still in the, in the medieval structure survived from, from those centuries. Um, you can't do it either in siege or warfare because you know, it's simply not the right um, terrain. Evil. It's closed and uh, it's a closed battleground. You can, of course, reform the infantry in some way, but again, the, mostly the pikemen are effective if they are in large quantities and against also a cavalry that can operate adequately. There is a lot of combat going on within the city gates, uh, as we were saying, cavalry does charge, it's really impressive, so it's not much that, but the, simply the infantry cannot react in the same way. They have pikes, they use them, but uh, in different ways. Uh, much more down to the small unit. And uh, what's a pike anyway? Right, the the jal that is these Italian pikes that, that recur in, in, in the terminologies were... They're, they're described, I think they're something like a four meters long, right? So they are legitimate pikes, like the same length that pikemen used them throughout all the history. Um, so my intuition was rather the following. Um, it's still imperfect, doesn't explain anything, uh, everything. But the sense is that probably, really, because also what kind of shields did other troops use? that the pavises were used by the majority of soldiers. 
right? Even the pikeman that uses this weapon with both hands can have the pavise slung uh, a lot, uh, across his shoulder, right? Uh, it's really typical. We even see that, like, it can do it with these bigger shields anyway. And there is no evidence whatsoever of the camping table fixed on the ground. We don't see it. Surely in siege warfare this happened in some, to some extent. But the Italians would actually build massive field fortifications. Uh, you know, if you stop to Pavises, you're not thinking that, you know, uh, big as this war fair actually was. But the most important thing is that, of course, all the sort of cheap prejudices that people have about the, the, the know-it-all, right, have about this Pavises, what they actually did, how they were employed is nowhere inside, all right? And then the later Pavise, that is very iconic, very, everybody knows what it is. I know it makes a lot of medieval, um, uh, etc., but it's not really all as you see. And there is a lot about medieval warfare properly we can't see. Um, and that we will hopefully also gradually come to dimension, in, also in the absence for us to understand better how the system really was, right? Um, so, um, what else to say? I don't think today we're going to finish the introduction, to the introduction. Um, so, that's how long these videos are gonna take. Um, Last time I criticized already Nicole's idea about, again, the... Uh, oh, look, the stuff. Uh, Italy was close to the Near East because of the traffics, because of the avant-posts, the crusades. So, look, this allows to the development of counterweight trebuchet, fire weapons, and the 14th century firearms. And who told you? This is the quest that all this stuff developed simply because of contact with the East. Don't get me wrong, uh, we still have to make videos about the counterweight trebuchet, etc. But, things like the counterweight trebuchet, of course, were not simply there in Europe historical. We ne never know, actually. Um, but, yes, technically it was more like a Middle Eastern thing. There is no doubt that in the so-called golden age of Islam, this was a thing, like, the Chinese were actually a more advanced civilization than the Arab one, um, imported Arab and military engineers, right, and so think about this, not necessarily even the more devil um, needs, uh, I mean, uh, has the, you know, at least preferentially produces stuff on its own, like, there is a great Eurasian intercontact that uh, doesn't matter how intense and, the, uh, and close the commercial contact between Italy and the Eastern Mediterranean is, um, is always operating, right? It's like with firearms are the best example because uh, firearms develop so differently in, or at least in different scale with different adaptability in China, for example, as opposed to Europe um, and the Mediterranean. So, was in that case, considering that these technologies spread practically immediately everywhere, like it's not, like you, I don't know, you went to the last castle in Scotland or, or in Lithuania, you wouldn't have this technology, right? We're using too much in terms of, okay, if you, so if you are underdeveloped, you don't have the technology. It's not that you don't have it, like you have it, but you don't have the assets to develop it to a bigger level. Indeed, when we look at the 14th century, we know that the Italians were on the, at the far forefront for uh, artillery in many ways. Uh, the Venetians, together with the Mamluks, had the best naval artillery. Uh, there, there was really a lot going on. But it's mostly the capillary spread, right? And how... Uh, like how you can document it, of course, and how, of course, this eventually takes on an, a relevant, uh, say, role in local warfare.
right? People go too much by uh, single dates, right? They say, oh, look, we, fir- we have the f- w- w- see, this is the key. We have the first document that I don't know in this city, uh, in this town, that, I don't know, a gun was, was produced for the first time. And what does that tell about the whole picture? Right, too few. It's not so indicative. I mean, it is indicative, like in this case, of course, for a place like Italy to give us the best, say, some of the earliest um, uh, evidence of this. And there is no doubt, maybe Italy was actually also one of the places where it actually literally developed first geographically. But how mechanically can this be connected to uh, the the contact with the East as opposed to actually? Uh, science, right, know-how, assets, investments, actual military needs. Uh, that's a really different thing, right? And um, this is how we should be habituated to think. I say it always. When you look at um, Westerners getting into Greek, Arab, Jewish translations. They don't do it because they have gotten for the first time a manuscript from the East. They do it specific, and this is specific of the West, because they have already developed the technology. They know, this is the most impressive thing, they know that those manuscripts are where, right, in the in the Levant, right, Constantinople, Egypt, whatever, the Italians are very involved in this because they are, in fact, the bridge uh, with the East. And they have um, outposts literally everywhere. Um, and they are also highly literate, highly advanced in many ways. But they go themselves fishing for this stuff and they bring it back to Europe. And there are people from all over Western Europe that do this. They used to do it with Toledo before. It w- and also after it was con- reconquered by the, the Christians because of the library there. Well, there are so many famous scientists who did so. Why? Because they needed to know exactly what was written in those. Also, because of intellectual curiosity. But because what they really needed at that point in history was a theoretical manual. right? If there were some uh, scholars that had already written about, say, how... Uh, certain technology worked you could simply use this to teach others rather than uh, in in a context that has already developed the actual technology materially and has actually even surpassed it right Um, say trebuchets were were already there when let's say we like they started appearing quite early at least in Europe and we we don't see uh, also on the basis of documentation what would be so strange of this being part of just the natural development of the local artillery that had always existed as opposed to any special contact with the East that would have provided them with this stuff so yes it's really quite advanced whatever but uh, again the contact with the East is not the cause right the size the size of one at least for the development of all this military technology Um, we um, what else can we say as an introduction Um, I think in terms of art of war strictly meant what the picture I gave you in terms of the pre post mid 13th century is the most important the passage from the separated autonomous cavalry and infantry phalanxes to the uh, three lines in depth with in, uh, of cavalry um, battles plus the infantry wings, right? And some other uh, note. Um, people were unaware of this, tend to focus instead mostly in these changes occurring in the late 13th, early 14th centuries. Um, in to the, the the spread of the condotta system, uh, this is not unimportant, but it's also somehow overrated, right? Uh, everybody knows the term condotta, right? That is pretty much the same 
one of indenture and, and there were different names also to to define this. So everybody knows of the age of the condottieri, everybody knows of that particularly later period in Italian history that wasn't even so important when we look at the actual development of the art of war compared to what had happened at the peak of the medieval civilization in these previous centuries that we described now. So let's give it some decent dimension. Um, first of all, the condotta does appear already like before this period in the actual forms of contract that had always existed. Again, Italy had had this uh, intense literacy and written culture from um, from ever. Like it was actually the, the first um, country historically in Western Europe to be that, to be that literate since Roman times to spread actually literacy to, to the rest of Western Europe. Um, and most of Europe, actually, because the other country was Greece, in at the end, but it didn't uh, go as far as essentially the Latin Christendom did uh, in that sense. And um, so it was completely normal to have written contracts of mercenaries. There had been foreigners, too, from, again, quite some time. The Germans, as we've seen, were a regular presence. The French, who... Uh, uh, so, during this time, as war increases, and for all the political and social reasons that we explained, there was more war, there is no surprise that um, condottas, so how essentially you had to conduct yourself in this, this regard, and le leading, actually, that, that's the etymology because that comes from he who has eventually to lead this troop also into combat, um, uh, increase. Right, and there is, um, um, again, also a pretty homogeneously Western way to this, meaning that the mercenary companies had always been there and had always been hired, um, again, uh, starting originally from, it's mostly the size that, of course, um, eventually changes, right? And Italy is later famous for entire armies that are contracted, right? Probably in the mid uh, 14th century, think about John Hawke with the White Company, that's the peak of it, right? Then also later on, with properly like also satellization of these um, armies and the condottieri, etc. But um, there's also a difference in the origin. Today we don't talk so much about that. Um, um, the um, the, uh, the the normal contract at the beginning of the period was something like I don't know a few tens of men at arms. They're almost always just men at arms. Like there is uh, some infantry complement, but it's not truly really typical, especially considering that in the late 13th, early 14th century, you have mostly foreign troops contracted, and you hardly have anything there of these German and French soldiers but men-at-arms, right, that's how they fight, right, there were some Catalan uh, Amogalvaris mercenaries from the Sicilian Vespers that were fighting against the Angevins from the Aragonese side, and when the war is over, the Angevins actually hire, and they send it as garrison in various Italian towns just to keep a bit like the order, but nothing inside them. They're just like, as you know, mostly infantrymen. These guys gets wiped out, uh, the hell out of the way in the early 14th century as serious fighting kicks in with Henry VII. And the Italians keep hiring en masse just German and French knights, right? They properly send their own envoys to uh, Central Europe and they hire their, these noblemen, their companies, directly from there. They didn't want to depend on other powers anymore for their recruitment especially the Welves, um, the Ghibellines had already uh, the, the German support. There was not any more one threatening the, the same Italy territorially, uh, even you know after Henry the Seventh and uh, you know other expeditions like the ones of Ludwig the Ludwig the Bavarian. As a matter of fact, the, the local Ghibelline fighters slash Italian lords um, 
are we're talking Milan, Verona, so the, the more powerful ones have more German knights at their service than actually the same German king. This is quite fascinating. Excuse me, I drink a little. And um, this tells you how, by the way, the entire notion of the increasing importance of infantry, all the story of the Almogavares, the Battle of Cephissos, Roger de Flore, etc. When observed in a more, you know, in-depth sense, like compared to how tougher Western battlefields um, really were, and then other decentralized and failed states, realities, well, you realize how different even our standards of thinking what actually matters in terms of the art of war really is, right? We have this obsession with infantry, but actually what here really dominates is heavy cavalry, the heaviest of all. And actually these are, as we were saying before, the same years in which those big infantry armies are declining. The only uh, type of infantry that truly remains with a very important presence and say at least tactical effectiveness is the crossbowmen which uh, increase also in, in speci uh, specialization again the, these Germans, these Frenchmen do not have they're always counted as men at arms and there is uh, like the infantry is Italian like it's provided by uh, like it fights under their you know their officers their their organization also because as we've seen they did something different like they weren't they were stationed on the wings and uh, it was normal for the same battle lines to be composed by people coming also from other parts of Italy together with these mercenaries and not only um, in uh, there is the famous battle of Parabiago at this point which actually the same German mercenaries are beaten by the Milanese uh, their allies, which is also a fascinating chapter. Again, lots of fascinating battles. Most people know nothing of just because, say, Osprey Publishing doesn't doesn't cover it. That's how, unfortunately and sadly, things uh, really are. In parallel, the citizen knight, mostly intended as a lord that had managed to, uh, let's say, a member of the most powerful houses of the city that had become sort of an oligarchic establishment is still the most important warrior at this time. Right? This is true also for the early 14th century. Um, the Italians, as we've seen in, in the previous part, were uh, tending to send other troops to fight in their stead. But of course, Italian politics was run by these uh, families that would go at war, where uh, essentially noblemen, like that they had a knightly lifestyle and were always heavily involved in all these political and military affairs and they, even though the minority compared to the foreign mercenaries they were the ones who actually retained control right, this is often what is misunderstood about this period also a bit the later one when properly there are these companies around that Italy is never actually taken over by foreign troops, right? These companies are always uh, guided, led, uh, I mean, commanded at least, and paid by I Italian powers that fight against one another. Right? The, the great company in the 40s, for example, is the, the only reason why it, it eventually doesn't do anything really, just come back, comes back to Germany, is that, uh, again, they had, it's, it's always the same story. It had remained without an employer. They began to raid the countryside of minor communes. Uh, there are some blocks in Italy that counterposed it to one another and then they come back to Germany. By the way, nobody settles now, zero. Like, uh, so this um, uh, period of Italian history has been often dramatized as, oh look, the, the usual story of Italy ruled by the foreigners, how? Right, this was the best, the uh, same Italian nationalist rhetoric that wanted to look at the Middle Ages a bit like, okay, we weren't unified, and since we're paranoid about this, let's pretend that this was the most terrible period ever. 
and look there were foreign companies here except if you actually study the the actual political context that the only rulers here were the italians um like except the south that was run by a foreign dynasty but, but the majority of the peninsula was run by an italian establishment and especially in the center in the north there was at this point like actually the failure of any power to actually intervene and in stabilizing affirming a rule whatsoever there are lots of foreigners that come in that past also still from central europe etc but essentially allies of the italians that pay for their expeditions to provide the man provide the money uh, mostly and that's it right you don't find a takeover and tactically speaking when you, when you look in fact at for example the, the army of pisa at montecatini there are these be beautiful terrifying germans that managed to break through um the the Guelph Angevin battle line, also together with, in fact, the other Italian troops, the combined arms tactics. In fact, they are heavily under the Pisan government. They don't do anything. Uh, they uh, they also can't fight without the Italian element. And the cities are safe and sound in the hands of the Italians. There is, for example, Luca that is exhausted by decades of war at some point is kidnapped by the Germans but if anything it's just like they offer the city to the highest bidder and still it is about the bidders are all Italian and eventually they take that over it's not like there is a permanent foreign stamp on the none of that even in this mechanism uh, this is relevant I would like to stress because again the number of foreign mercenaries of actual men-at-arms so that make the ultra the heaviest bulk of, of, the, of the story is immense and yet Italians control it right the, the, there are acts of insubordination similar things uh, incidents for sure but there is no takeover no say no situation even going close to like anything like a a foreign affirmation this period if anything all the great powers abroad are contracting even the the angevins in the south in the first half in the second half of the of the 13th century were quite active speaking of their assistance to the central italian wealths at this point they bail out they they ran out of money there's a massive crisis the, the crisis of the mid 14th century is shocking right the papal power decreases the imperial power uh, decreases like there is no way to subdue italy like again like the 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 Hohenstaufen had tried to do in a truly political and territorial sense like also the angevins in the south are just there the the current rulers as the the Swabians, the Normans had been, um, but it's an establishment that continues from centuries, right? And so it's um, um, it's a quite interesting moment, telling the truth, the moment of the decline as well, that is sort of less glorious than the one that we described before with this rise, this expansion and development of armies. In fact, armies simplify a big deal. But it's also important to see how, of course, like in the Western civilization as a whole, like the system shrinks but does not collapse either, which is often run, say, I think pop culture does not understand the extent by which the mid-14th century crisis affected Europe, even though it's still sort of somehow a popular topic with black that and all. And... At the same time, it sort of underestimates how much, uh, how successfully Western civilization um, recovered from this uh, in a, but of course, on very different bases as well. Uh, so it's a very interesting and controversial topic in many ways. And Italy does show very well the crisis. I mean, every country does, like the. France does, Germany does. There, it, it gets worse a bit for everybody. Like it, there is no doubt. Um, 
uh, and uh, so when you look at the rise of the condottieri, essentially you do look at that. You look uh, look at the same erosion of public power of um, city uh, liberties, probably even of individual liberty. Right? Uh, there is a demilitarization of the people. There are more fortifications within the city. Armies become smaller. There are less resources in general. So it's extremely difficult to look at these uh, these times. Compare especially to what like the great medieval civilization had been before. But you also understand why there would be more room, for example, for companies, especially when there was such a great war like the Hundred Years One and truces. And so where would this these armies go after having ravaged France, Italy was the better option, was rich and divided. And then in the la very last decades of the fourth century, uh, 14th century, you have actually a complete and final Italianization of the condotta, which opens to the 15th century, that is the moment in which properly Italian lords become condottieri. And so that's another moment of state building that passes to the professional arms of the leaders and it's all another system today we do not look at it because it's not part of our timeline but it's still extremely important to frame it correctly because um, especially the age of the soldiers of fortune is uh, pictured a bit like for the sake of itself right uh, it's not that it didn't happen or it wasn't important but it's first of all too dramatized too disconnected from, as we were saying also in the previous video, from the actual ABC of Italian politics, because uh, everybody can say, oh my god, look at this company of foreigners was so successful, yes, but then you should just know how framed, heavily framed within uh, Italian power system really was, um, rather than being, uh, again, a, a thing on its own. And, um, and generally speaking, also the later condottieri period, uh, actually I don't think it gets too much um, recognition. I actually would like to talk way more, especially about the 15th century, because I get the impression, it's a realization I had right now, that um, yes, nobody talks about the Italian communal armies in actual depth, but even when you think about the condottieri age, it's mostly, again, the, the age of the soldiers of fortune as opposed to the actual, like, also more interesting, more developed type of warfare that happened uh, later on, right? Uh, in the, the times of the White Company were ones of, again, li literally, like, autonomous um, war bands coming from, from other countries. Um, later on, you have... Like the, the Venetian Condotta, this is one of the most satellized, powerful, uh, developed armies of the era at, at the level of the ordinances of Charles the Bold of Burgundy. And, you know, that's quite a thing, actually, just compared to some Romans in the century before. So we shouldn't underestimate at all the general contexts as much as why they are not popularly received. I made, for example, a video about 14th, 15th century Venetian forces, properly army organization. And I always remember there is a guy who asked me, I left a comment because I think it was very eloquent, It said, oh my god, um, like, I, I knew, I don't know, the Venetians had a strong navy, but I had no idea about this, about the Venetian land forces and how relevant they were just to mention those like you know you, we could have talked about the Milanese we could have talked about you know even the, the Neapolitan ones actually pretty impressive we'll have to do it at some point and it's not just about those by the way every place has its own thing in many ways but the question is as always like why why didn't you know that 
like it's very good to come up with a statement like that but you should also ask yourself at that point why didn't you know that's crucial that's fundamental it's like you know knowing you know that there is something wrong and uh, legitimately wanting to know at that point who uh, sort of withheld this, this kind of information who didn't make a picture of that because it's a quite big thing it's not like um, again this is always the point of it all it always feels as if this history has been um, reside or just put in the in the background and not really resumed very much uh, at especially at the pop level but it's true that also the the historiography hasn't done too much of its work right um, as we said throughout the video the employment of professionals tended to make late 13th and 14th century Italian warfare more extended in the first place this is really evident the growing wealth of cities for example led to a great strengthening and elaboration of fortifications we don't talk too much about fortifications in general but when you think of Italy first of all city gates right at some point even thrice um, uh, say thrice built uh, around the original Roman reign which tells you also how demographically big the systems were considered also from a military point of view the Italian city-states are so populated that as many uh, inhabitants are present within them uh, as in the city district itself so we're talking about massive cities even of hundreds of thousands of inhabitants and that's the actual proportion this is also scary if you think uh, that it had never happened historically right in, in Roman times there wasn't such crowded a, cr a crowded urban space and the medieval one was really that intensively um, compact right and think about this for what we said also in the previous video that is the, the city districts themselves were fairly small like they were normally a few hundreds of uh, square kilometers all right so concentrating resources being always in rocked um, these cities and the, the countryside was all fortified were some hundreds of castles uh, in, in each city district really tells you how interconnected the system was how truly um, say interdependent with, with the others it was uh, and how warfare could be carried out in the first place in such spaces they're incredibly close uh, compact narrow even uh, and the forces mobilized we've seen were enormous which also by the way makes you think looking at the type of expeditions they carried out etc like how uh, powerful these armies were just to actually proceed across these countrysides without an excessive fear for like uh, say for example being worn out in the supply lines or whatever it is true that that bigger campaigns were relatively limited and that of course just you have more mobility of course when the um, in the first half of the 14th century you have incipient original states that have pacified large areas disarmed the populations essentially just cashing the, go uh, the, the money and um, paying more mercenaries to just run back and forth by the way in all these sieges and the devastation of enemy territory were the main strategies right the notion however that there were few full-scale battles is uh, just also like for most medieval history um, wrong right of course there are relatively few when you look at uh, the other larger say the, the, the majority of the engagements about uh, this period and these places are the best ones because we start seeing in great depth thanks to the Italian chronicles 
this incredible and very modern production of sources um, that are incredibly accurate and uh, reliable by way on this military affairs all those tiny expeditions that historically would always be carried out like in warfare by every power but that would have not been recorded with that level of interest and detail that of course a citizen could have even participating in these battles and in any case knowing practically uh, practically everything about the same time. And of course, even when you besiege uh, an important stronghold and you have all the strategical reasons like just to use it to push further, especially also against the enemy cities, that start becoming, especially in the 13th century, the objective of, exp of the commune's expansion in the 14th century start taking each other all out right from from the game entirely so that's also how the regimes uh, say that the regional states are founded in Italy right on the cornerstone of the cities that remain there etc but they are subjected to the bigger one is of course um, uh, like having a relief army trying to break the siege and of course major battles to be actually fought over these castles and uh, it is uh, that spectacular because again there are so many big battles going on that you don't find objectively yes that frequently also in other regions of Europe which makes this all the more interesting and uh, really unique right that the degree of of belligerence is really the highest uh, in Europe right and this um, of course required enormous costs like today I'm, I'm about to end also because I'm out of voice due mostly to uh, issues I've had in the recent days that I told you um, but uh, everything starts becoming for example cavalry armor Right, as elaborate and scientific, providing excellent protection while still allowing freedom of movement. Again, the uh, the, the 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 excellency of the Italian uh, armor uh, armor makers is like quite renowned abroad. They start exporting lots of this stuff, of course, and there is a great. We've seen it also in the other uh, other episodes of the of the series that. Practically all the Mediterranean in Europe starts getting Italian arms and armor in some some places. Like there's a very strong influence, um, and uh, that goes also very far. And um, people used to say also that this increase in uh, the, the weight of armor is just connected with. Oh my God! It, it had to be bro uh, broadly speaking, like about the impact of crossbows right it's not just that right uh, it's not even other infantry weapons it's surely everything contributed this were very important as we've seen but it's, it's the entire type of warfare. you can't explain the development of a panoply just by saying oh like it must have been just this weapon in the system and the rest right is not there it's the entirety of the reason like these places were very rich they could afford this better armor uh, by the way armor is becoming that heavy and articulated pretty much everywhere like it's not just the Italians peak the the production certain technicalities but overall like as I said at the beginning there's not so many ways you can make a shield but there's not too many ways you can make armor either right and so everything is um, everything makes sense when you put it in inadequate perspective it was just a very dynamic rich um, impacting context and of course this would be reflected by the type of armor that is there without mentioning by the way that there were as we've seen all these mercenaries coming from like France Germany that had very advanced arms and armor uh, on the road and so this also adds a bit to that heaviness 
overall there were particular styles we'll see them in Courbouillie there were some people connected with the fact that Mediterranean was hotter they tended to have less metal but anyway um, uh, this has hardly much to do with Byzantine or Islamic influence via southern Italy unless you of course you consider this in the broader picture but why shouldn't this have been properly like, like a local thing that they developed for whichever reason um, very well however I would stop it here for today we have just a very few to say to add about the introduction generally we covered everything then we'll pass to the iconographic and archaeological side of the story for today really stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye